Anyone who can play a musical instrument has a special talent, but someone who can craft an instrument from raw material is truly gifted. Harold Evans has developed the skills to do both, and like many gifted musicians, his journey began at Indiana University. I graduated from IU in 1970 with a Bachelor of Music degree in perform violin performance. And at that time, if you recall your history, that was the height of the Vietnam War. And I really didn't want to go to Vietnam and uh, shoot bullets, so I decided maybe a good alternative would be to try to play my violin in the military. And landed a job in the U.S. Army Strings, uh, U.S. Army Chamber Orchestra, I guess you'd technically call it, in uh, Washington, D.C. So for nine years under the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations, I played at um, my violin for foreign dignitaries at uh, parties at the White House and State Department, and I met my wife in that same job. I was the first woman in the United States Army Band in the string orchestra, and uh, Harold was away on leave for a year, and when he came back, it was about the time I started graduate school at Catholic University and I needed a violin teacher. He was adjunct faculty there. And uh, I signed up for my master's program and they assigned me Harold Evans to be my teacher. And uh, that worked pretty well, but he's a really mean teacher, so I had to marry him to get him off my back. <laughs> I was fascinated with woodworking when I was a child and I did a lot of woodworking in my parents' basement on my own and I enjoyed working with wood and as a violinist, I needed a better instrument, so I put two and two together and I said, well, maybe I'll have to build one. Harold apprenticed with a master violin maker for three years while he collected his tools and the finest wood he could find. The process of making the scroll or the neck of the instrument is to start out with this solid chunk of wood here, put your tracing on there, which you've gotten from the old violin that you've traced, probably, or some book that might have produced a, a pattern. Trace that pattern onto here, put little holes, dots with a pin on the parts that, uh, that are going to end up being the scroll part. Then, after you got the pattern traced on here, you have to take it to the bandsaw and cut out, I can hold that up here, cut out that pattern with the bandsaw. And that's about the last power tool you're going to be able to use on this for building this part of the violin. And then after that, take a small scraper and scrape it in there to get it smooth. Not a lot of sanding. So, A lot of the testing that you do is, is not so much visually, but by feel. If it feels smooth and you've got a nice, and of course you look at it for symmetry, from all angles, but you can look around here like this, make sure that the, everything is, looks like it's coming out at the same angle, straight. He used to stay up quite late at night. Sometimes he wouldn't get into the house, back in the house, um, till two, three in the morning. Because if he was carving on a scroll or working on um, an F hole or something, you don't just drop that. You have to finish it so that the continuity is there. Soft wood on the top because that's that's your that's your vibrating plate. It's more like a speaker. And of course, we measure this plate to make sure it's the right thickness. It's called graduating the plate. That's one of the so-called secrets of the sound of a violin. And we all, each of us violin makers has our own graduation pattern. The purfling is, uh, has some controversy behind it as to what exactly it's for. Some people, of course, think it's just decorative. That's, the purfling is, are these three little strips of wood that go all the way around the violin on the top and back plate. And, and somewhat more controversially, it has a lot to do with the sound of the instrument. Um, because you're cutting, it's, this is not like a pinstripe on a car, it's not painted on. These are three little strips of wood that are inlaid into a groove that you cut in the top and back plate 
two thirds, approximately two thirds of the way down the plate. And so therefore you've got a more um, flexible plate that's vibrating easier on that instrument. It's not, not like nailed down or screwed down to the instrument tight. It's very, it's very supple and very flexible, which creates more tone. This is where I keep my personal violins in a safe. Um, this, this one I'm showing you right now is the very first violin I built in 1977. I've got that on the label in here. And I call it Opus One. And um, it took me about three years to build this violin. The second violin I built took me about three months. <laughs> this was my first instrument. And now we'll jump to the very latest one I've just built. And that's the cello. I just finished this cello. I started it many years ago. I actually have a 1981 is the label in here, Opus 4, but I just finished it because my daughter didn't need it until recently. She just got big enough for a full-size cello. So I finished this up. It was in the white for about 20 years. <laughs> in the white means with no varnish on it. Nobody was playing it. I was just kind of waiting for her. And she's very excited to have it, and she sounds really good on it, so. But building beautiful string instruments just doesn't seem to keep Harold busy enough especially if he can find a project to build something outside. This is a suspension rope bridge that I decided to build last, last spring after spending a long winter indoors and I just love to be outdoors and doing things, building things. And I needed a project, so I decided to bridge this gap between that part of our property and this part. This bridge is about a hundred feet long and it's held up on one end by a dock that I built myself and then on the other end by two trees. I was kind of shooting from the hip on this one. I didn't, I had no idea how to build the bridge like this. My dad has four degrees in music but um, so much of his favorite stuff is, is completely unrelated. In violin making, somebody told me how to do that. Nobody taught me how to build a bridge, so it was a real big challenge. I wasn't really surprised. He's always trying to build stuff. He's always, he's always curious. He sees something he likes, and he's like, oh, I want to make that. <laughs> Natural vibrato, huh? Ooh. The violin that I play was actually uh, an instrument that my father built for my mother in honor of my birth. It feels different than any other violin. It feels more comfortable, more familiar, and uh, it has a, a unique sound as well. So I can, I can pick it out of a crowd of different violins if somebody else is playing it. The feeling of playing or holding in my hand an instrument that I've built, especially playing one, especially if it turns out to be a really good sounding instrument, is indescribable. I cannot even explain what that feels to me. I tried to explain it to somebody once, and I equated it somewhat to what a woman must feel like when she gives birth. I just, it's, it's, it's probably the closest thing that, I'm, that I could ever experience as a man to giving birth. It's, it's my child, it's my baby, it's my creation, and and to be able to play that instrument is just phenomenal. I can't, I can't even describe how exciting that is.